So welcome to Tales of Blue. My next guest enjoyed a 16-year professional career with over 340 appearances along the way, which included a brief spell during a turbulent period at a much-changing city side of the late 1970s. A warm welcome to Barry Silkman. How are you doing, Barry? Good evening, Mike. Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks, mate. And you? Very well, thanks. And thanks again for joining us. No problem. So Malcolm Allison's return to City in January 1979 was a major factor in your arrival at Main Road having worked with Big Mal previously at Plymouth. When did you first hear, Barry, that the chance of joining you at the club? Um, well, he he disappeared from Plymouth. One minute he was there, and we played on the Saturday. And then um, I, he always used to give me Monday off. I used to come back to London. He used to give me Monday off, and I'd go and train on the Tuesday. So we played on the Saturday. Then on the Monday, I'd get a phone call. And the guy says to me, I'm Bobby Saxton. I said, who's that? He said, I'm your manager. Where are you? I said, you're what? He said, I'm your manager. He said, where are you? I said, well, you obviously know where I am. You just phoned me at home in London. Yeah. Because yeah. there's no mobiles there. Of course, yeah. Um, and it, it was actually strange because at first, Bobby called me into, the, um, into his office. I went there on the Tuesday. He called me in and I went to shake his hand and he wouldn't shake my hand. And he said to me, as far as I'm concerned, you're Malcolm Allison's player. You're not my player. And if he comes in for you, you can go. Okay. And I said to him, well, I'm not your player. I'm not Malcolm Allison's player. I'm no one's player. The only player that I am right now is Plymouth because they pay me. And I play football because I love it not because somebody may or may not be the manager. So we started off on, on a real bad footing, yeah? Okay. But then um, a while later, maybe three or four days, he started to have a little bit of a change towards me. And then we went and played a game, and I had a really good game, and we won. I think we won 3-0 at Swindon or something like that. So what age and was you at this stage, Barry? I was 20-something. Yeah. <laughs> I was about 27, something like that, 26, 27. And he come up to me in front of all the players after the game. And he said, I've got you all wrong. And I hope you accept my apology. And held his hands out and I shook his hands and I give him a hug. I said, Bob, if you don't mind me calling you Bob, no problem. We all make mistakes. I've made many. You've made many. And we got on like a house on fire. After that, um, I only played one more game. And then right out the blue, I got a phone call in my guest house where I was staying to say that um, Manchester City had made a phone call and they want to buy you. And that's when I first knew about it. I didn't have a clue Malcolm was going to come back and buy me. Not a clue. He never, never mentioned anything. Say one minute he was there, then he was gone. It's unlike today, isn't it? We can keep an eye on what everybody's doing. On oh, media God. Or wherever the world is slightly is what different. Doing. Right, yeah. Um, it's a different world. So, £60,000 fees agreed with Plymouth. But how smoothly did the contract talks go with the deal? I mean, um, bearing in mind what you did after football, Barry, was you sort of in charge of your own contract? There were no That's agents then. There were no agents. You just went in and negotiated the best deal you could do, and that was it. It was more... I mean, I remember going in at Crystal Palace. Um, I had one year at Crystal Palace, and Terry Venable said to me, if you do really well, Silk, I'll give you a new contract. And we got to the end of the season, and Kenny Sanson was going in for a contract, and so was I. So Kenny said, Silk, listen, you're more up front than me. Go in, do your contract. When you come out, tell me what you got. <laughs> so... I remember walking into Terry Venables' office and he was sitting on a platform behind a desk on this huge chair. And I was sitting in this tiny little chair. I felt about four foot six. <laughs> and um, he went to me, Silk, he said, you've had a real good season. What are you looking for? So I said, well, TV, I'd like £100 a week on top of my basic wage and £100 a week on top of my appearance money when I start a game. He said, I said, that's what I'm looking for. So he said, well, where are you looking for it? Because you're not going to get it in here. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you £50 a week rise and £50 on your appearance money. And he looked at his watch. He said, you've got 30 seconds to make a decision. I went, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> and I went out 
And Kenny said, what's happened? And I told him exactly what happened. He said, I'm not doing that silk. I want a hundred quid on mine. So he went in, he said, wait for me. And we'll go down the cafe. We had a little greasy cafe at the bottom of the, uh, the ground. And he said, wait, silk, we go down the cafe and, and have something together. So I said, yeah, no problem. So in he went. He was in there no more than two minutes. He come out. He went, I've got the same as you. He said, I've got 20 seconds to make a decision. I said, well, I had 30. So he gave me a bit more leeway. <laughs> Great story. So that's what it was like back then, you know. Take it or leave it. Yes. Um, so was you familiar with any of the current players in the City squad upon joining? Oh, I knew all of them, obviously, because they were all big names. And I'd met, met uh, only met a couple of them. I hadn't met many. I'd met them when I'd been at Crystal Palace. I'd met one or two. But I didn't really know anyone. And they didn't know me. And there was this Flash Harry arriving from London. And it was all Northern lads, mostly. And they had never had a clue how to take me, you know. Yeah. And... I find it. I found it a little bit difficult at first, um, but then within a matter of weeks, it was brilliant. I got on great with all the lads. Every one of them was top class. So I was going to say, a London boy at heart. So how did Barry Silverman set into Manchester life? Did you move straight up in the first few months, or did you commute? Yeah, no, no. I moved up straight away. I went up straight away, and I ended up living with Colin Bill John for a while, um, and I knew. I knew Manchester because I'd been very close friends with George Best for a number of years. So I'd been up to Manchester a few times. The best time ever was when George took me to Billy Connolly's birthday party in a place called the Sandpipers. And, oh, God, that was some night that I didn't drink alcohol, but I watched everyone else get paralytic drunk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Different nights out, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. So there was yeah, a lot of changes going on at City and personnel on the club at that time with following Big Mouth's return. How did you find the atmosphere within the squad when you joined? Yeah, the atmosphere was good, but I think Malcolm and Tony Book, I think it was more Malcolm, not Tony Book. I think Malcolm made a number of mistakes with the players he brought in. He was letting players go too quick. You know, I had a number of discussions with him and I said, Mal, listen, you know, I've only worked with you for a few months at Plymouth, but you got to know that I'm a pretty good judge of a player. And I think you're pushing these players aside too quick. And I thought that was the biggest problem at the time. Tony, Tony, Tony and Mal know. there, was it Big Mal calling the shots as he came yeah. back? Tony had a good settled side at City. Great yeah, mix. it started going a bit wrong and that was when Tony signalled from Malcolm. I think Tony was a bit concerned that he might lose his job because it it had been going a bit pear-shaped. And I think if Malcolm would have just brought one or two players in and steadied it down, it would have been a lot better. I think he, he pushed aside too many players. Too soon. That was my opinion anyway. Yeah. So goal-scoring City debut comes on the 31st of March, 1979, in an arrow defeat at Ipswich. What do you recall of that afternoon, Barry, and how you performed from a personal point of view? I remember the night before, but I won't go into that one. <laughs> Not George Best in this club. <laughs> no, the night before. Something I've never experienced the night before a game. And uh, I'm not going to go into details on here, but well, it will be in my book when I write it. Oh, OK. Can you give us a snippet or just the name? <laughs> Let's just say there were women involved. OK, right. So what's your call of that game? <laughs> And the, the actual game, um, I was just really enjoying the game and because it was my first time in that scenario. And what was crazy is that Bobby Robson was the manager of Ipswich at the time. And I'd been with Bobby when I was 16 years old at Fulham. So I knew him as a, as a manager and as a person. And I remember I always played with my socks around my ankles and... I remember the goal I scored. Everyone said it was the most a brilliant chip. So it was about 35, 40 yards out and I chipped the goalkeeper. And I've never ever really told anyone the truth of what happened. I picked up the ball about 15 yards inside my area and I was already feeling tired. Pace of the game was a lot quicker than what I'd been used to. 
And as I got over the halfway line, I beat a player. And I got about 10 yards inside the Ipswich half. And I felt both my calves getting cramped. And I was about to fall over. And when I looked up, the goalkeeper was miles off his line. So I didn't chip it. I actually hit it as hard as I could. And I didn't even see the ball going because I went down with cramp in both calves. The next thing I know, the players were jumping all over me, said it had got in. And then after the game, I was interviewed and they said, that wasn't the most amazing chip we've seen at Ipswich. And I said, yeah, I was looking at the goalkeeper out. He was going, I thought I chipped it. Yeah, it <laughs> wasn't true at all. I just did it as hard as I could. <laughs> so you start all of the remaining 12 games of that 78-79 campaign, scoring three goals along the line. You take up the number nine shirt. How was you finding the transition to first division football? Because it was the first time you'd played first division football. Yeah, first, first couple of games I found um, a little bit quicker than I was used to. But after the second game, third game, no, that was it. Just fine. No problem. Because yeah, you seem to find your feet fairly quick in the first division. It was a big change for you at all. Yeah. Colin Bell was in his final season at the club, following a fantastic career in the game, obviously. I mean, you appear alongside Colin during that spell, including his final City game against Villa on the last day of the 79 season. What are your memories of Colin being in and around him at that time at the club? As a person, I loved him. They all called him Nijinsky because he was such a good athlete. Sadly, when I went there, he was running with a limp. Yeah. And... He couldn't shake it off. There was no way he could keep playing. You know, that burst of speed had gone. His change of direction had gone. And he was such a wonderful player that you noticed the difference because he was so good. You then noticed the decline very quickly, sure. all because of an injury. Uh, as a person, ah, he was different class. Absolutely loved him to pieces. Fantastic guy of the game. So the squad you joined had a great blend of experienced pros like Joe Corrigan, Dave Watson, Mick Shannon, mixed with some great young players coming through, like Peter Barnes, Gary Owen, Paul Power, which big now, as we touched on a little bit, he decided to break that up during the summer of 79. Big changes. Did you see them coming at the time? Did, no. How did it sort of just no. Just happened. It seemed like every day we went in, there was another player turning up. I thought the best buy they made while I was there, but I thought was brilliant, but he didn't suit English football, but he was brilliant, was Kazi Dana. Yeah, I was going to ask you about him. Yeah. He was absolutely brilliant, but he just didn't suit English football. I remember the club he came from, We a part of the deal was that we went and played them in a, in a friendly match yeah. and he played for them. And when he played for us, he was all right. But I, I could see his brain and you could see the positions he was taking up on what he wanted to do. And it was as though he was one step ahead of everyone. Yeah. And we had some terrific players, Asa, Willie, Paul, Shan, all terrific players. But he just seemed to be one step ahead. And then when we went out there, he played for them. He took us apart. He absolutely destroyed us, which was good for me because it made my own belief in my judgment that I was right about him. Yeah. Okay. Was and he, he was a lovely man as well? Was he unsettled in Manchester? The change because it was quite unique. I to think have a, a different fam yeah. family found it difficult. He found it difficult, but I think it was the football he found difficult. He was just playing a different game, really, to everyone else. So a lot of youth team players were breaking through around that time as well. Tommy Caton, Nicky Reed, Steve Kinsey, Ray Ranson, to name a few. Who do you remember? Barry has to stand out young lads coming through at that time. Well, the funny thing with Ray, I remember watching Ray in training. He was with the youth team and we'd finished. I watched him in training. And Ray, Ray will tell you the story. If you ask him, he'll, he'll tell you what happened. And I watched him and I thought, what a good player he looks. And he walked off and I said to him, what's your name? He said, oh, Ray Ranson. I said, what's your situation here? He said, I'm being released. I'm just trying to find a club. I said, don't go. He said, what do you mean? I said, you're good enough to get in the first team. He went to me, you're mad. He said, I'm telling you, you'll get in the first team. So I went up to Malcolm. I said to Malcolm, this is the following day. So Malcolm, there's a lad playing in the youth team, Ray Ranson. 
He said, yeah, he's no good, Phil. I said, have you seen him? He said, no, but all the reports I got from Dave Viewing and everyone else, he's no good. I said, they're wrong. He said, why? I said, because they're wrong. I'm telling you, you get on our team. So what you should do, bring him training with us. And if Kenny Clements gets injured at any time, play him. So remember them days, there was only one sub. It's not like you'd have 35 players sitting on the bench, you know. So he joined us. A couple of days later, he came over. And he done really well. And then Kenny got injured. And Malcolm come up to me and said, do you think Ray's ready? I said, put him in. I went up to Ray. I said, I've told Malcolm to play you. He couldn't believe it. He was hugging me, kissing me. He played him. And Ray never looked back. No, fantastic career in the game. And he would have been playing non-league somewhere, Ray. So City head to Scotland for the Skull Festival Trophy during the pre-season of 1979 with games against Coventry and Hibs. Did you feature in that mini tour? And do you have any memories of that, Barry? Oh, God, no. The only memory I have is playing abroad in a pre-season. But no, I, to be honest, most of the things that I, I remember are just during the season, actual proper games and things that happened with certain players and conversations that were said. I remember a lot of that, but that pre-season tournament, no, don't remember it at all. I mean, were players worried at the time with so many leaving that you could be out the door next at the drop of a Yeah, hand? no one knew what was going on. Yeah, you know, it was when they talk about a revolving door, that was a revolving door. Mickey Robinson came in, Steve Davey came in, could make lovely guy, Steve, he was brilliant, but I couldn't make it or tell that when we see him training. It was like a million pounds. He couldn't make yeah. it. He, he was a great guy, but, you know, he'd want a bit more than that for a million pounds. It all yeah. got a little bit out of hand, didn't it, I think? Yeah, it went a bit pear-shaped. So you, you know? start all of the, the first eight fixtures of the 79-80 campaign, but lose your place in the side around September. Steve Daly arriving at the club, as you mentioned. Was you given an explanation as to why you were left out, Barry? When the, you know, the no, Malcolm was just to me, look, be patient. Um, everything will be all right. You'll come back in, which, you know, I did. I was patient and waited and then come back in. Because you then get sort of, you you appear for the reserves during October and November before heading out on loan to his Rayleigh really side, Tel Aviv. I well, I actually played it. The, the, the last game I played was actually against Crystal Palace. I played against, um, I played against Palace and that's what, Destroyed my career that game. It worked in what way, Barry? Again, this is a story that's never come out. It's never been told. And it's, again, it will be in the book. Mm -hmm. We played Crystal Palace. And at the time, it's very difficult for me. I was staying with Malcolm and his wife, Sally, who sadly has passed away not that long ago. And... I'd known Sally for a long time and Sally was having a lot of problems with Malcolm. And she asked me to move back, to move in there with them. And I said, Sal, you know, it's very difficult because I'm playing in the team. Malcolm more or less yeah. is the manager. So she said, please, Silk, I really need you here. I've got big problems with Malcolm. And I thought, do you know what? Life is much bigger than football. And I don't really care what people think. I'm going to go. And if all the lads don't like it or if people don't like it, so be it. So I went back and lived with them. And then we played Crystal Palace. And Ron Greenwood, funny enough, was um, there doing the man of the match. And we got beat, but he actually gave me the man of the match. It's a lovely man, Ron. And he gave me a big hug at the end of it. Give me a bottle of champagne, which I gave away so I didn't drink. And then off I went. I went home to London. I went back on Sunday night. I got back to Malcolm's place in Sally's in Marple, a place called Marple, a little village. And Sally said, have you seen Malcolm? And I went, has he not come back? Did he not come back on the team coach? She said, no, and I haven't heard from him. So I thought, well, he'll turn up training on Monday. So I went on a Monday. The first thing Tony Book said to me is, where's Malcolm? So I didn't know what to say. Mm. I went, oh, he's got really bad flu, Tony. And he's at home. I, well, what can you say? 
difficult position for you. Very. So I go back on the Monday, um, go back after training, and phone Terry Venables up. Terry was close to Malcolm. I explained to Terry what happened. I said, if, has anyone heard from me? So let me find out. He called me back four or five hours later, maybe at eight o'clock in the evening, and said, still, no one's seen him. So I start making a few phone calls to nightclubs, nothing at all. Phoned up his friend, guy called Arthur Shaw. Arthur hadn't heard from him. Sally was panicking. I get in on Tuesday, and we're playing Manchester United on the Saturday, by the way. So I go in on Tuesday, and he said to me, Tony, what's happening? So I said, Malcolm's still really ill. Didn't know what to say. So we trained on the Tuesday. And sometimes we had a Wednesday off, but this week, because it was Man United, we didn't have the Wednesday off. So we went in on the Wednesday, and Tony said to me, what team does Malcolm want to play on Saturday? So I said, the same one as at Crystal Palace. Now, what had happened? Willie Donaghy and Paul Power have swapped over. I'm not sure what one started, but at half-time, he changed one of them. So he said to me, Tony, what one? The team that started or the team that finished? <laughs> I went the team that started, yeah. He went, okay, so we did all this pattern of play. We did some free kicks and we get back to the ground because we used to jog to the training ground, then jog back to main road. And when I get there, the chairman's there. He comes up and says to me, what's wrong with Malcolm? I said, he's got a really, really bad infection. He's really ill. So he said, I better come over and see him. So I said, well, the doctor has said no one should come over. And he's Peter Swells this once. He said, why? So I said, well, there's a baby. Malcolm's got a newborn baby. And if somebody comes in and brings an infection in, because Malcolm's in, I didn't even know what to say. I was talking like a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, and he don't want anyone to come in contact with Malcolm. He said, well, you have. And it hasn't affected you. I said, yeah, the doctor thinks, because I live there, <laughs> I'm, I'm immune. Yeah. So he said, well, I'm coming over this afternoon. Oh, no. So we're sitting here. He had a green Jaguar, Peter Swells. I'll never forget this. I sit watching TV and the window is behind it. And I see the Jaguar pull up. I go up, I put the chain on the door. I sit the Sally, just tiggle the baby. Just keep tiggling the baby and make the baby cry. Whatever you do, just make that baby cry. Literally come up the little driveway and the baby's going, ah, it's like crying and screaming. I've opened the door with a chain. He said, can I see Malcolm? I said, no, the baby's screaming now. You can hear they think the baby might have caught something. I'm really sorry, Mr. Chairman, you can't come in. He was not a happy man no, at imagine. all. So going on Wednesday night, I phoned everywhere. Is Malcolm there? Is Malcolm there? They're going, what, Mal Malcolm Allison there? Malcolm Allison there? Everyone, no, no, no. Now we get to Thursday, he don't turn up. Now we're banging trouble, yeah? I thought, oh, I don't believe this. So going on a Thursday, we go over all the free kicks again. And Tony Book said, Malcolm definitely wants to play the same team. I went, yeah, exactly the same team. I get back on the Thursday. And on the Thursday night, I said to Sally, I'm making a mistake. I'm saying, is Malcolm Allison there? What I should be saying is, can I speak with Malcolm as though I know he's there? So I phoned up the first nightclub, said he's not here. Second night after nightclub I phoned up was a club called Tramp. It was owned by a guy called Johnny Gold, who's passed away now. And I said, could I speak with Malcolm, please? And the girl said, oh, you mean Malcolm Allison? I said, yeah, of course. She said, hold on, I'll go and get him. This is at like 10.30 at night. He comes on the phone, he goes, Silk, Silk, I'll explain everything tomorrow. Can you pick me up at Manchester Piccadilly? Train got in about quarter to nine or something like that. Pick me up. So I went and picked him up. I got to Manchester Piccadilly. He come walk along the platform, never forget this. The same suit on, from the same shirt and, shirt and tie that he had at Crystal Palace. All the suit was creased up. He hadn't had a shave all week. So I said to him, Mal, listen, 
give me the jacket. We'll put the jacket in the boot of the car, put the tie in the boot of the car, and no one will realise you've got the same trousers and shirt on. He went, good idea, Silk. So I've done that. We went in. He's gone into the changing rooms. He's changing rooms with Tony Book. And he's come out looking a million dollars. He's had a shave. He's had... So we go out. I told him what had happened when I was in the car. So we go out. We train on the on the Friday. When we come back, they said, can you wait 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Can you wait till the team sheet goes up? So it was about an hour we waited. Then the team sheets go up. And as they do, I turn around to Asa. I said, hey, see you tomorrow. He went, Silk, I think you better look at the team sheet. I went out and looked. I weren't there. I looked at the other team sheet, the reserves. I was 14th man against Man United reserves. And what happened, Sally actually fell out with Malcolm over this and ended up getting divorced. The chairman had called him in and then he'd admitted he'd been in London, admitted that I had lied for him. Mm -hmm. And literally killed me. Chairman yeah. banned me from the club, said, I never want to see you back here again. So and that was your was... city career finished then, Barry. There was no way back from that. Fascinating no. story. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. So you eventually joined Brentford after just 21 appearances at the club. So how does Barry Silkman look back on his time as a city player? I mean, following that story you've just you've just shared is great beginning, very sad ending that was completely out of my control. Looking back on it, would I do the same again? Probably yes, because Malcolm was a friend. So I suppose a friendship was worth more than a career. Well, it was for him, for sure. I'd still do the same again because of Sally. Yeah. So I'd still do the same. I loved my time there. It was very short, much shorter than I wanted it to be. But as I say, that was completely out of my hands. There were some great lads there. Big Joe, Dave Watson, Paul Power, Boothy, Tommy Booth, Ray Ransom, Gary Owen. Never forget coming out the dressing room, the, the, the training ground one day. This voice went, there's only one Gary Owen. <laughs> it was just so funny. Just one supporter and was cheering for Gary Owen. He was a great lad. Asa. Top man, Mick Shannon, all of them, I've got to say, every one of them, Nicky Reed, Steve Kinsey, who I still speak to now on Facebook, all great lads. Yeah. I can't actually say there was one wrong in there. And we had Roy Bailey, the physio. He joined in more than anyone, Roy. It was like he loved a, a night out. All great, lovely people. Really, really lovely people. So what's a favourite memory, Barry? If I said, give me a favourite memory from whether it's in a game or a, an away day, something that jumps out immediately at you. One was the night I can't talk about. <laughs> and the other one was I, in my whole career, I never wanted to head the ball. My first ever league game was for Hereford. And I used to love jumping up, heading the ball, loved it. And one of the players called Dixie McNeil, he went over to the mirror, started taking his teeth out. He was our centre forward. I went, Dixie, what's happened to your teeth? He said, oh, still jumping up, heading the ball, getting elbowed, getting people's back of their heads. And I remember going over and going, no way I'm going to lose them. So I never jumped up to head the ball unless no one was near me. And the biggest memory was scoring a header against Wolves when somebody's flushed the ball in from the left wing. I've gone to the near post and I actually meant to flick it on into the middle, but I've caught it wrong. And as I caught it wrong, I've gone, Fuck it, I can't believe I've caught it wrong. Next thing, everyone's screaming and have gone across the goal into the other corner. But I didn't actually mean to score. I meant to just flick the ball on. And that was my biggest memory was actually scoring with a header. It was the only one I scored my whole career. Did you mean to score any of your goals, Barry? Going back to the Ipswich chip stuff. The, Ip the Ipswich man and the, the Wolves won. No, definitely no. So what do you think of the modern day Manchester City 2022 side? I've got some terrific players. I just don't like a lot of the way the modern games played. You know, we used to play 
Terry Venables was the first one to do it with me. We used to play a session called 20 Passes a Goal. And what Terry would do, let's say you had 16 players as an example. He'd put nine on one team, seven on the other. And the nine had to have 20 passes to score a goal. So you'd go sideways, backwards, you'd go anywhere just to get the 20 passes. And I find modern football today very frustrating, a complete lack of individual ability to beat a player. Not everyone, just talking generally. Mm -hmm. I find it very boring a lot of the time. And I just find there's too many passes backwards and sideways. So many games you see a player's got the ball on the edge of the area and he's got a one-on-one -on -one with a defender. But rather than take him on, he'll play it back 25 yards to his right back. He gets closed down and plays it to centre half. He gets closed down, it goes back to goal. He's just gone back 100 yards and the commentators don't say a word. And then the goalkeeper just smashes it. And you think, what is that? I, I think I love a lot of the players at Man City. Kevin De Bruyne's exceptional. They're one of the only teams that do look to go forward a lot. But there's still so many more times that teams, not just Man City, other clubs, but the teams evolve now, as it the club has evolved into something more than a football club. Yeah. And the team, they have some terrific players and have had for the last five, six, seven, eight years. So following your career, Harry, you become a highly successful football agent. Did you ever have any many dealings with players joining City? No. No. So what's um, Barry Silkman up to of 2022? Um, still a football agent. Also got a music promotion company. I've just done my brains doing a tour. So I think I'll take a back seat on that one. Um, the last deal I did, or the last couple of deals that I was involved in, was um, Rudiger going to Real Madrid from Chelsea. Um, Paqueta going to West Ham. And a couple of years ago, Suchek going to West Ham. They're the, the very latest deals. Thing is with Manchester City, you've got to find a player of real high calibre. Sure. I did, I tried to do a deal there two years ago. I put a player into him who I thought would be terrific if he went there. He would really thrive. And he was £45 million. Pound. And they come back and just said that they don't fancy him at all. And it was Declan Rice. And I think maybe they made a mistake. And that was probably the closest I come by offering them Declan Rice. But their level of player is so high. You know, they've raised the bar to a, a massive degree. And what they've done, in effect, they've turned the clock back a bit to the days of Dennis Stewart, Francis Lee, where everyone loved to watch them play. Yeah. And they're probably the only, them and Arsenal are probably the only two teams that I love watching play now because they do want to go forward. They still go sideways and back maybe too many times, but they do want to go forward. They do want to hurt the opposition and they have got individual players, which is the same as Arsenal. I think the club now has gone beyond being a Premier League football club, if that makes sense. They're now a massive business. Sure. That's a pure powerhouse, for sure. Barry, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and share your tales of blue, and I wish you all the very, very best for the future. Thank you, my friend. The same to you. Wish you well.